Oops. Good morning. Woo. <clears throat> That's a little hot. You, you, you're getting used to Pastor Hiller. He's shorter and I'm louder. <laughs> okay, just see. <laughs> we want to welcome you to worship this morning and pray that God blesses you to join with us in fellowship before his throne. Ben, you got a couple announcements for us? Good morning. Um, just a reminder that our uh, offering, our giving, is in the plate as you enter in the sanctuary. You can also mail in your offering, drop it off sometime during the week, or go online to the Give tab of our website, which is www.tlcas.org. Today at 9.30, we've got a number of Bible study options. Um, kids crew for all of the kiddos will be downstairs in the fellowship hall. We are going through the theme of Simply Loved this year. Um, so we are super excited about that. Week one last week was awesome. So we would love to get even more kiddos down there today at 930. Uh, of course, right after you give them coffee and sugar. Um, the other Bible studies that we have are adult Bible study options. In here with our very own Tom Speed is music and scripture, um, diving into uh, different music that we uh, sing in services that we find throughout the scriptures. And I think he's even having uh, people kind of start working on writing their own songs. And they may complete a song as a class, as a group, to sing during service afterwards sometimes. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Pastor Mike will be finishing up the mini-series of basic Lutheran beliefs over in the Omega building, the second school building from this direction. And then one of our elders, Harry Woods, is leading his study on the battle plan for prayer, also in the Omega building. Um, and there are signs there that mark which class is which. So I would highly encourage all of you to figure out which one of those studies intrigues you the most and dive on in. National Youth Gathering registration is now open uh, for a few more weeks for all of our current high school students. If you are interested in registering your student for that, or if you're a student that is interested in the National Youth Gathering, please come talk to me afterwards. That will be next summer, July 2022, um, and it will be held in Houston, Texas this year. I will be at the Welcome Center after service, so if you have any questions about that or any of the other announcements that I'll give you this morning, stop by and let me know. Confirmation uh, orientation was last week, and we kick off our first regular confirmation gathering today from 12.30 to 2 o'clock down in the fellowship hall. So we're looking forward to our first one today and uh, just getting to know each other a little bit better and diving into uh, this faith walk and walking with each other throughout this next year. Elevate for high school youth or high school youth night is this Wednesday. Uh, this Wednesday's Elevate will be at a host home. So come talk to me or shoot me a text for that address and information. Again, this week's Elevate is at a host home. Hallelujah Harvest is October 9th, Saturday, October 9th, from noon to 3 p.m. Um, this is one of our top three community outreach events here at Trinity. Uh, we do a trunk of treats, we do games, we do crafts. Um, for obvious reasons, we're going to do pretty much everything outside this year, weather permitting, uh, which God has blessed us in abundance ways with weather over the last handful of years. Uh, Either the last three years or for sure the last two years, it has snowed the day after Hallelujah Harvest. And it has been beautiful for the day of. Um, so Hallelujah Harvest is, again, one of our largest community outreach events. Um, serving a number of people from the community, from the school, from our church here. Uh, we have people that use us as a turnaround to get to one of the other Fall Fest areas. And they stay because we're free. Uh, we give them a free pumpkin. We don't charge them to park. We don't charge them for food. We don't charge them for the bounce house. You see where I'm going with this. Um, to have a successful hallelujah harvest, we need volunteers, though. Uh, we have maybe half a dozen trunks. Usually we shoot for at least 12. 
we have a very small setup crew. It takes a small army. Um, clean up, not as big of an issue because usually people stay, clean up what they did, and then head out. Um, but it's a three-hour event that we need people monitoring stuff. We have a bounce house that we purchased in February of 2020. March 2020 said we can't use that for the next year and a half. So we have a bounce house we haven't gotten to use yet. Uh, we're planning on using that for Hallelujah Harvest, but we need people to run that. Um, yes, my students can do it. It would be better for an adult to do it because my student's not going to say, hey, stop tackling that small child. They might jump in there and just pull the kid off, but they're not going to say it. Um, so we need volunteers. We need volunteers to help monitor some of the crafts. We need volunteers to stand at a bounce house, keep a timer, and tell kids when to get out, when to hop in. And then every half hour, fog it. Uh, we need more trunks, people to just decorate the trunk of their car. You can go simple with it. You can go extravagant with it and toss a piece of candy at a child. We need people to help set up. We need people to clean up. So if you don't want to be around the crowd, if uh, standing in front of people or talking to strangers is not your thing, come help us move some stuff. Help us set out the pumpkins. Make it look pretty. Um, decorate some stuff around. Help someone decorate a trunk that doesn't want to decorate but wants to hand out candy. Team up with people, okay? Um, you can sign up with me for any of those volunteer positions after service over at the Welcome Center. Talk to the people that are by you. Look to your left, look to your right. Guilt someone into helping. Just kidding. Lovingly encourage them to help. Um, but again, this is one of our top three community outreach events, so we need the volunteers to be able to do it, uh, to be able to make it a success, to be able to just shine a little bit of Christ's light to our community. Uh, Pastor Mike's book is uh, now open for orders. I have order forms over at the Welcome Center. Um, I have yet to fill mine out, but I will be doing that. And then our American Heritage Girls will be taking Butter Braids orders today and next Sunday. And then uh, the youth will be selling greens, our annual green sale, the week after that. If you zoned out on anything or you fell asleep, stop by the coffee corner, get coffee or tea, and come ask me if you have any questions. Uh, my book actually is on sale on Amazon starting the 1st of October, but I will bring copies here in November when I get them printed, uh, so we can just sell them in here. You can wait for that if you want to pre-order Real quick, also, we have our, I will be, I'm leaving tomorrow morning for Haiti, uh, so you can pray for our safety. It's the first time I've been in since the president was assassinated and the earthquake happened, so we have a lot to do in a short amount of time. Only three of us are going. And then uh, November 6th is our national banquet. We're going to have it. It's in the tech center. There's Comedy Works South at Landmark. There's a ballroom right next to it. It's going to be in the ballroom. They'll have tickets on sale. You can see Luann. They're $75 each. There's an auction. I'm trying to get some special people there. I just talked to Alfred Williams this week from the Broncos and told him I want him to come as an NBC, MC, and he said, well, we'll see my schedule. So I might be able to get some of these guys there. We'll see. But come and you can hear about uh, what's going on with Mission Experience, see the plans for the school we're building, see the plans for the church that we're building, and all the stuff that's going on. All right, a lot of announcements today. Let's stand up and greet one another. <laughs> Let's begin with our first hymn, What is the World to Me?
God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all of our hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in the ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God has had mercy on us and forgive us all of our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. May he strengthen you in all his goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. strength, the author of all godliness. By your grace, hear the prayers of your church. Grant that those things which we ask in faith we may receive through your bountiful mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. First reading is from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. This is the word of the Lord. We just according 
to St. John, the fourth chapter. Jesus said to her, this is at the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in the truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. This is the gospel of the Lord. We may confession of our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. You may be seated as we invite the children to come forward for the children's message. Good morning. Hi. (laughs) Well, you can hear from back there, too. I'm pretty loud. It's okay. How are you guys this morning? Good. Good? Yeah? You're sleepy? Awake? What are you doing? Yeah? You awake? Yeah? Can you guys help me? Do you like to make noise? Yeah. Yeah? (laughs) Well, I need some help, because in the... In the um, psalm for this morning, it says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So there's a lot of noises we can make, and I was trying to figure out which one is the most joyful noise, okay? So can you help me with that? So I have this. (laughs) Is that a joyful noise? Yeah? That's pretty joyful, huh? It's like your hands are clapping. Yeah. See, she's getting joy out of it. Um, Let's see. I have another one here. Oh, I think we'll leave that one in there. <laughs> How about this one? <laughs> Is that a joyful noise? Yeah. That's a pretty joyful noise. Yeah, I have another one in here. Oh, this one you'll like. How about this one? <laughs> Is that a joyful noise? Yeah, that's pretty joyful. And I didn't have any symbols, but how about... Yeah, it's okay. Is that a joyful noise? Yeah. Yeah? There's lots of noises, and they could all be joyful, right? It's really not about the noise that makes it joyful. What's it about? It's about what you feel in your heart. It's about being joyful. Why does the Bible say make a joyful noise to God? Because we're thankful. He's God. He created everything, and yet he loves each one of us. Just the way we are. Yeah. He loves us so much he sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. And to rise again so we can go to heaven. That God. He is God. He's God of everything. He created the whole universe. Which we can't even imagine. And he loves us. And so the Bible says make a joyful noise. Be thankful. Be joyful. It really doesn't matter what kind of noise you make. And you don't have to use an instrument do you? You make noise other than an instrument? What's a good noise you can make? A joyful noise. Uh, what do you say when somebody scores a touchdown? 
yeah, right? Something like that. Hooray. Yeah, yay. <laughs> yeah, yay. Yeah, there's all kinds of noises. But the point is not the noise. The point is to make it joyfully because we're thankful to God for all he's done for us, that he loves us. I heard some joyful noises just a few minutes ago. People were singing. Is that a joyful noise? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Singing is absolutely a joyful noise. Any noise you want to make to God to praise him and to thank him for everything he's done for you is a joyful noise. So I'd like to hear some of your joyful noises. Do you want to practice? Do you have a joyful noise? Can you say yay? Hmm? Can you say hooray? <laughs> How about you? Can you say hooray? Really loud. There, that's a joyful noise. So on the count of three, I want everybody to make a joyful noise to the Lord because he's God and he loves us. Okay, ready? As loud as you can. One, two, three. Hooray! Those are joyful noises. Let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are wonderful, you are amazing, and you love us, each one of us, just the way we are. Help us to live our lives in worship and praise of you for all you've done for us, for the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. And help us to make joyful noises throughout the world so that everybody, everywhere, knows you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. We continue with the hymn of the day.
mercy and peace be multiplied to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you've allowed us to gather together again in this place. Continue to pour out your spirit as you have already done in this worship service upon our lives. Open our hearts and our minds to you. Challenge us with uh, your word, Father, and move us by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I know it, sometimes it's kind of hard to keep up right now with me being gone and Pastor Hiller preaching on something different and then coming back and preaching on you almost have to see who's up here. But I want to get back to really a series that I'm going to be working on for a while. And uh, October's still rough, but then in November I'm back on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, we're talking about the missional ministry triangle. And, and really, what are the facets of our ministry here? And, and if we're going to be a missional ministry, what does that mean? Because it's not just evangelism of old. It used to be churches had an evangelism committee, <coughs> and, you know, we basically said all the evangelism of the church is down to you three people. you got to do it. A and the problem with that is we would designate three people with the task of the whole church. See, that should be all of our task. Our, our, our task should be all this concept, the way that we live out in mission right here. In fact, if we get visitors, it's not the job of, of some evangelism committee or welcoming committee to welcome them. It's actually all your jobs. Now, we don't want to overwhelm people, but it really should be that you see somebody. It should be your mindset that I want to go and welcome them and find out their story, not shove a church down their throats, but find out their story. But if we're going to look about a full missional life, it begins here in worship in the way that we live and act together. You know, we're beginning to learn some truths or, or some of the things that I hold dear to my ministry and as a pastor, any church that I'm over lives by. You know, one of those is, we've, and I'll preach on this in a, in a few weeks, but the whole concept of experiencing God, that God is always at work around you and in you, and you, your goal is to find out where that is. Just see where he's working, and then you join him in that. Wherever that is, around you, your community, because remember what I've said many times, you do not take God out there. God is already active. You see it, where he's already active, and you participate in it. A, a second one that we started here already is you're blessed to be a blessing. We did that a couple weeks ago with those who work with us from Luhai. We realized that God was gathering them here. God has blessed us as a community in many ways right now. And, and so we did a dinner to honor them, not to ask for anything, not even to invite them to our church. Just simply because God has blessed us, Genesis 12, that we become a blessing to others. But everything we're going to build upon is going to be the up arrow right now, upward. Because all the other three, inward, outward, missional ministry doesn't start if we don't get worship right. If worship is not the center of everything we do, and now I'm not talking about just how many bodies are here and how you're keeping this pew warm. I'm talking about being engaged with God. An energy wholly other than what you are in this place. I started this two weeks ago, and I want to walk this a little further this week. Tozier said this years ago, worship is the missing jewel in modern evangelicalism. We're organized, we work, and we have our agencies. We have almost everything. But there's one thing about the churches, even the gospel churches do not have. That is the ability to worship. We're not cultivating the art of worship. It's a shining gem that is lost to the modern church, and I believe we ought to search this until we find it. Interesting that he calls it a modern gem. And he's not saying we're missing worship because we're doing it. We're doing the activity of worship. But what does it mean to come? And set sacred space in your lives and sacred space in this place in which you're meeting God. See, during the week, 
this is just a room. You can call it whatever you want it. You know, when I grew up, it used to be you'd run around the church as a kid, and some adult would yell at you and say, you can't run in God's house. Right? You were probably some of those adults, right? No, no, no. I'm pretty old, so you weren't those adults. But really, theologically, that's not correct. That would be correct in the Old Testament. For God did dwell in a building made by human hands. It's not correct in the New Testament. This is a building. You don't uh, actually go to church. There's no such thing. You are the church. We come up with a concept of, of building here. But something unique happens as the people of God gather together in this place. It does become the church. And what does it mean in your minds when you think about you are going to worship? Now, remember what we said a couple weeks ago. Worship is not an activity you attend on Sunday mornings. Okay? If your mind said, oh, well, I, I worship for maybe an hour a week, that means you spend a lot of hours a week you're not worshiping God. Then we've got our theology all messed up. This is either the culmination of your week or the beginning of your week, depending how you look at it. To gather together with God's people to inspire you, worship Him, do the sacraments together. But worship is a lifestyle. It's how I recognize that God engages me every morning, every evening, and every day. You've heard me say before, if you ever come a, with a mission, on a mission trip with me, and it doesn't matter where in the world I go, but especially to some place like Haiti, you realize we pray, we pray all the time. We pray when we get up. We pray at the, every meal. If we're leaving, we pray before we leave, and we thank God when we get back home. We pray when we start a job, when I start pouring out all the uh, power tools for everybody to operate on and can't keep an eye on them all at once. We pray when the job's done. We pray when the workday's done. We pray at meal. We have devotions. We, we'll pray like crazy. See, what I'm trying to get people to understand is that we should always be living like missionaries. Not just when I take you to a foreign country. And, and I tell pastors from around the country when I meet with them, my goal is, and you'll see this on our website, you give me your volunteers and I'll give you back missionaries. You don't start as a missionary. But we want to breathe a lifestyle into you. And it's the same thing here, breathing a lifestyle into you that simply becomes part of the norm for you. The worship that we're missing is lifestyle worship. Tozer also says we are called to a holy preoccupation with God. This is one of the best examples I've heard uh, of worship or definitions. Worship may def be defined as humanity's response to the realization of God's presence. You see, even your worship is not something you in, or is initiated by you. See, worship happens when you realize you're in the presence of God, He has touched you with His grace, and then your response is worship. It's still a response to Him being in this place. So we gather to worship. It really should be the concept of how do I set sacred space in my heart. Now that could be any morning. That could be here on Sunday mornings, coming together and, and first taking a moment saying, God, be in these moments. Set them apart for holy purposes. That I am engaged by God. Please understand, you cannot leave this place the same way that you walked in this morning. You may think you are. Isaiah 51 says that as the heavens are above the earth, so are, not 51, 55, so are God's ways above our ways. But he says his, his word will not go forth and return to him void without first accomplishing his purposes. So God's word goes forth and it won't return to him without doing something in your heart. 
It may be rebuke. It may be drawing you closer to God. It may be encouragement. It may be you closing off to God and actually pushing yourself further away. But there's going to be something that happens in your hearts today. Not because of me, but because of God. John 4. We talk about the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, the gospel lesson for today. It says, Jesus says to her, you shall worship me in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. And in other words, from the very core of our being, the, the depth of who we are is an engaged and in, with an encounter with God. You see, truth is your mind. You don't want to come to worship and shut your mind off because then we have a cult. Right? And people say, you know, just because the preacher's saying it's right. Guys, there's sometimes that I might overstate something, and I'm not perfect. You ought to be comparing what I say always with the Word of God, not just with any pastor, even when I leave. Because the Word of God's ultimate authority in my life, not a, not a pastor. Okay? Plus, remember this, it's not the pastor's job to grow you. Hello? Do you hear me? It's not the pastor's job to grow you. It's time for the church to take up the responsibility that growth is up to you. And you are part of that growth. It's time for we in our homes, for parents, to take up the responsibility. It's not the church's job to educate. Yes, they'll do confirmation and things, but it's your parents' job to be leading them to Jesus and talking about Jesus. When you come, Jesus is saying, the fullness of who I am is engaged in worship. My mind and my spirit. In everything I do, not just music. Because sometimes in today's culture, we hear the word worship, and all we do is think about worship songs. And again, what I've said two weeks ago is because we've created a worship music industry. Nothing wrong with that. Except not all those worship music industry songs are about worship. And so not every one of modern songs should be in church. It may say something about life, but when we're gathered here, all focus is on the one who comes and enters into this place and challenges us. And all praise should be about him. And not, not about us. So some of our songs, if they're not focused on him, are great songs. But we don't come here to sing about us. Worship begins with a heart that has been touched by God. It says in Psalm 104, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courtyards with praise. Give thanks to him who blessed him. Now, all the ancient cities, not all, but a lot of the ancient cities had gates around them like Jerusalem. There's two things that happen. There's something that happened at the gates, and there's something that happens at the courts. The gates were gathering places. People would gather there together, just like we gather for worship. And then they would enter into the city like we enter into worship. So when we first come and we gather together... We stand at the gates. It's kind of like when we gather in worship, we stand at the gates. And then we begin to sing. We're offering, enter, entering into corporate worship together. But let's be honest, guys. There are some weeks that I gather together that I stay the whole service at the gates. Sometimes it's like I'm just watching everybody else because of the way my week went. And I really enter into worship. I'm kind of there. I'm saying the words. But I'm a spectator. So it's saying enter in with thanksgiving. Come into worship with thanksgiving in your hearts. And if you're not there, maybe you need to be, begin to, to, to pray that God give me a spirit of thanksgiving. You know, some uh, psychologists I know we always talk about like being happy. Sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. And, and we talk about sometimes, actually, there's studies that it, it, you just fake you're happy and actually you become happy. Sometimes you need to enter into worship and you're not there and you just have to focus in on the words and let your heart go in singing to God. 
Now I'm going to give you some praise this morning. Because I love it when you guys sing out. Yes, I preach at a lot of churches. Yes, I travel across America. And it drives me crazy when I, when I go to a church and I can barely hear anybody. I was like, I need to go here for like four weeks and preach on worship. Make a joyful noise, not a joyful whisper. Sing out to God. Guys, if I will sing out, you can. That is not my gift. I leave that to my wife, okay? But I will sing out, and I will express myself. If you watch me in worship, I'm a very expressive person, and I kind of get away with it in a lot of Lutheran churches because I'll go in, and I'll start lifting my hands, and they'll just say, oh, he's the missionary. He works overseas. <laughs> he's just a little off, and it works really well. I went to a Epiphany Lutheran church, and somebody came up to the pastor afterwards and said, wow, he's really emotional, really loud and out there. And the, his response was, yeah, he's a missionary. <laughs> so I get away with it. But the Bible says to lift holy hands to the Lord. That's all I'm doing. Now, I'll tell you, Jesus' prayer position was not actually on the knees with the head bowed. That's a modern European prayer position. Nothing wrong with it. It's what you were taught. It's fine. It's probably not the biblical one. Jesus probably mostly stood, looked toward the heavens, and lifted his hands. It's typically the prayer position of that day. Lifting holy hands is just one doing what Scripture says. And what is worship song? Worship song is just a prayer to music. So what am I doing when I do this? What's a child do when he wants their parent to pick him up? That's it. That's it. And if you're doing it to impress anybody, you're doing it for the wrong reasons, so keep your hands down. I'm not here to impress you. You're not here to impress me. But you here, R and I, are both here to enga be engaged with the Holy God and offer him all that we are in this place and realize that an encounter with God is unlike anything else will happen in your life. And it will change you. See, entering into his thanks, his his gates with thanksgiving, and then the courts. The courts were the decision centers of the cities. That's where the elders came together and made all the decisions. So I enter his gates with thanksgiving, and now I'm getting into the holy places of God with praise. So it's actually, there's movement going on here. I'm entering, and then I'm walking towards. My goal is to be in the center of the courts, decision place of, of heaven. When I take communion and when I center my life around God and worship, it's all focused together right there. Worship is, is not about music. It's not about where you worship. It's not about the building. You know, today we're into these Actually, it started about 20 years ago, and it totally annoys me. We're, we have these worship wars about what kind of music you sing. Should you be traditional? Should you be contemporary? Should you be, I don't care. And I can't believe God does either. Whatever leads you into the throne, my mom would have never gone to a contemporary worship service. <laughs> That's fine. I actually love both. Whatever leads you there, use. There's a sense of preparation. Begin worship by centering your heart and your thoughts on God. Coming with a right attitude and openness to what God has to do in this place. Realizing we're coming in touch with the energy that is different than we are as humans. And make yourself vulnerable. Lay your life before God that God can choose to do whatever he wants to do in this place. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 16, verse 5, really quick. See, we, we tend to narrow worship down to a location. And yet, one of the most precious worship services recorded in Scripture occurs in Acts 16, verse 5. It's verse 25, that's why it's not looking right. But after about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there came a great earthquake, 
so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. Where are Paul and Silas? Prison. Not in the church. And yet there is this holy time of intimacy between them and God. Why? When are you most likely to pray outside of church? Or pray the most? When life goes in the crapper, right? That's when we pray the most. That's when you're more or less likely to, to get on your knees. Although the word worship, prosukamai in the Greek, literally means to be on my knees. The original word, be, I, we've lost that concept. Guys, sometimes we were so quick to get out of the Catholic Church, we left some good things behind. Hello? And one of them was kneeling. We don't do that anymore. A and I know, I, I go to churches right now, and I, I was at one last week. Everybody does the, the line because it's, it's easier and everybody's concerned about COVID. But man, when, when we stop kneeling at the altar, for me, something sacred. We lose again. That position of humility before God. That you know what? On my knees, I can't fight God. I can't even argue with God. I'm there. The uh, first recorded picture of worship in all of Scripture is in Genesis 24. Turn there really quick. First picture of scripture, in scripture, of worship. Then the man, man bowed low and worshiped the Lord. He said, blessed is the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. First recorded act of worship in scripture. He bowed down low in a position of humility. You see, there is something sacred in that concept. Remember when in Genesis 3, Moses is before God, before the burning bush. What does God ask Moses to do? Take his shoes off. Why? Holy ground. But there's also another reason. You see, in these days, you didn't go to uh, Walmart to buy shoes. There was no Target. You made them. You made them. And there's something symbolic when God says, remove the shoes, is remove the very thing that you've made so there's nothing between you and I, and it's just you touching the ground. There is something sacred here, Moses. That you must remove that which you made and stand before me bare. It says in Hebrews chapter 9 that before God all things are laid bare. Believe me, if you're here today and you think you're hiding anything from God, it may be hidden from us, but not from him. He sees your struggles, your concerns, your issues, even your questions and anger with him. And it begins by literally, it doesn't have to be figured, I mean, it can be not literally, it can be figuratively, but you bowing your life before God in worship. In Samuel, there is a uh, sacred second, I mean, Samuel, 1 Kings 10, there, there's a section of scripture where the Queen of Sheba comes to see Solomon. And she is amazed of his wisdom and his wealth. But if you read 1 Kings 10, she also is amazed by Solomon's ascent to worship. In fact, in the Hebrew, when Solomon ascends to worship, she is basically in awe at what she's seeing. What's that concept? In real life today? It would be someone walking to church, never being in church before, sitting in the back row, Rome, back row, watching you worship and be awed by what they see. They may not understand it, but they're awed. Because they see that you're not holding anything back from your God. You're worshiping from the depth of your being, and you realize in this moment, you're having an encounter with the Almighty. 
if we don't get this right in worship, we've missed something. It's not just gathering with his people because that's a social club. Very important part of our lives together. And we're going to get to that inward angle of our relationship and what that means in the weeks to come. But if we aren't first encountered or realize we're encountering God, we've missed something. True worship is that spiritual action in which the God of the Bible is affirmed to the highest value. Now, remember what I've said. You cannot lift God any higher than he already is. You can't do that with your praises. God is already on the throne. There's nothing you're going to do to make him any greater than he is. But when we worship, it's saying, God, be lifted up in my heart. Be higher inside of me. Raise up inside of me more than you've ever been in my life. In this place, help me to meet you. Richard Foster says this about worship. If worship does not change us, it has not been worship. To stand before the Holy One of Eternity is to change. Worship begins in holy expectancy and ends in holy obedience. It's realizing we enter in this place to meet the God who sacrificed His Son to grant you and I forgiveness and grace. And no matter how our weeks have gone, that we find him in this place, breathing life still into us, that washes us clean by his grace. That we simply go out there and live with him living through us. That we offer ourselves here that he might become a reality to others through us when we leave. Worship is the center of all we do and all we are. And if we don't do it, the Bible says, the rocks will. Because God will get his worship. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand for prayer. (laughs) Friends in Christ, I urge you to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me. As Christ our Lord has taught us and freely promised to hear us. God, our Father in heaven, Lord, would look with mercy on us. You needy children on earth and grant us grace that your holy name may be allowed by us, may be hallowed by us in all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living whereby your precious name is blasphemy and profaned. Lord, in your mercy, may your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will both in life and in death and in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. In your hands we commend, Lord God, those in our community who need a touch for your hand. We pray, Lord God, for all who are struggling because of COVID, God. Some of our teachers in the preschool, Friends, family, Lord, as it continues to ravish some of their bodies, Father, we ask that you would be with them. And Father, we pray for deliverance from this, that you would be with us, God. Be with Michelle, the daughter of Danny and Joy, SB, Lord God. Continue to heal. Let your hand be on her. Be with the friends or the family of Kevin, my friend who passed away 
Lord God, from COVID, let your presence and peace surround them. We, Lord God, we would fall, uh, fall on milk and whose cancer has returned. Strengthen her, Lord God, and let your presence surround her. Be with Kathy Dees, Lord God, that you would bless her in her body. Let your mercy and grace fill up all those areas that are lacking in her life. We also pray for Nathan and Beth. Is their schedule to leave Asia on September 29th and come back to Nebraska? That you continue to bless their ministries, Lord. Fill them with your peace and your presence and guide them the next step of their lives. Father, we ask you to be with our team entering Haiti. That you would keep us safe and in your care. Bless the, the time with our children and the staff there. Even though it's not as long as it normally will be, make it significant. Bless all those who continue to struggle with crisis around the world. From the earthquake in Haiti to those who are still struggling in Afghanistan. To the Haitians who are trying to get in on the southern border, Lord God. Be with all these people and all who are in need. Praying for them at all times, thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy, grant us our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares and help us to trust in you to provide for all of our needs. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us our sins. As we also forgive those who sin against us so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue your flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil and all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil of body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. We trust you, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Receive now the benediction. May the good Lord go before you to lead you. May he be behind you to encourage you. And beside you to befriend you. May he be above you to protect you. Beneath you to support you. And inside of you to inspire you. May you go in the power and peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We worship together.
You may be seated. We go in his peace and serve the Lord.